Welcome back to Razmafsar TV. I'm having Beat Razmafsar Australia here back on our channel. Hi, Beat. How are you today? I'm well. How are you? Thank you very much, Beat. Today we are going to talk about South American archery, or I mean, also Amazon, and in that area. And so, please describe yourself. What are we going to talk about explicitly today? Well, see, I mean, South America is a huge continent and archery was practiced from the northernmost jungles all the way down to Tierra del Fuego and I've actually seen um arrows and a quiver from Tierra del Fuego uh, you know like from from me to the camera uh, away um in the um Grayson collection in the uh, University of Missouri Columbia in the Department of uh, Anthropology our American friends can arrange to go and see this collection. There's about 5,000 archery items, including everything from Persian bows to um, the most basic uh, uh, of South American bows. Mm -hmm. South American bows have been written about for quite a while. Aside from the historical reports of people um, rowing boats up rivers and getting shot at by the, the locals who didn't want them rowing up their rivers, uh, it, Saxton Pope... Um, one of the founders of modern archery in America, or certainly hunting archery, um, wrote a book called Bows and Arrows, uh, where he analysed a lot of museum specimens, uh, including uh, some quite rare bows from uh, Argentina, from the Pampas, from the tribes that lived on the Pampas. Um, very, very long self-bows. All the bows that, that I know of in South America are self-bows, they are often made of very hard exotic woods. I mean, they're exotic to us. Obviously, they're not exotic if you live in the Amazon or you live in some of these uh, areas. Um, the skill in making bows and the how I put it, the ingenuity in design. Like I've seen bows um, from Brazil, which have triangular cross sections. <laughs> And you couldn't make that out of something like yew or elm. It just the 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 belly of the bow would ripple and disintegrate. But these are made out of uh, Brazilian hardwoods. And I mean, in in modern bow making, uh, people making uh, um, long bows from laminated timbers often make long bows with a bamboo back. And an ipe, which is a, a dark, dense uh, uh, wood from the from the jungle, belly, because it can handle so much compression. And you can make these bows quite slender because the ipe can store so much energy. Is that only, get... excuse me, Bill, does it only grow in South America, ipe? Yeah, as far as I know. Uh, it might grow up into a bit of Central America, but my... My knowledge so far, and I'll check this. We'll have another discussion with more technical detail yeah. Um, yeah. because, I mean, I, I hope that we can get a, a, an overview of South American archery uh, to to um, give us a basis yes. for looking at it. Because, I mean, you know, South American archery is diverse because you have archery in jungles. Yes. You have yes. archery on the flat plains. Now, before the um, Spanish introduced horses, the flat plains, you had to walk around. So that the people that lived on the plains were very tough and athletic people. I mean, because you just had to go such a long way to find anything to eat. Uh, and you also had a combination of agricultural peoples using the bow and arrow for occasional hunting and sometimes for warfare, you had um, hunter-gatherer peoples who were using the, the bow and arrow as a mainstay of getting food. Uh, you had people that were um, hunting exotic animals to sell to the coastal civilizations like the Incas and the Chimu and all these people that used to live along the, um, the west coast of South America who wanted uh um you know uh monkey pelts they wanted exotic bird feathers i mean there was a huge trade in central america as well obviously in feathers 
And to get the feathers, you had to shoot the birds. So they had to develop highly accurate archery in dense wooded areas, which I think any hunting archer will be able to understand just how difficult that is. Uh, and some of their equipment might be explained by the environment that they had to use it in. The other thing people did was fish. Uh, there's quite a lot of uh, evidence of people fishing with bows and arrows. Uh, the arrows they used for, for fishing were really big and long. So you could you would have a, a, an ordinary sized bow, you know, slightly smaller than a long bow, and you'd have an arrow that was as long as the bow, if not longer, so that you could you could be in your little boat going along the river. And remember how big some of these rivers are. Yeah, yeah. And you could you could get ready. You could basically put your arrow about where the fish is, and then pull back and shoot, because the arrow was sticking out so far in front of the bow. Um, in fact, the, the thing that I, I would consider one of the qualities of South American archery, excluding the, the areas in the plains, in the Pampas and that, and further south in Tierra del Fuego and, and places like that, um, it was big, solid arrows, the size of a javelin. Um, and there may be a reason for that, because some groups, some cultures, uh in the 20th century, still use spear throwers, which the the the, you know, the Nahuatl word is is um, a cloth. And um, uh, one tribe I saw, and this was in a documentary on television back in the 80s or 90s. Uh, so take it with as much, you know, how much you can believe it. But I think it was fairly accurate. They use spear throwers for warfare, but bows and arrows for hunting because uh, spear throwers were the more um, noble weapon. And you see it's the same thing that you see in Europe and Asia where the more efficient weapon becomes, oh, we don't want to be killed by that. It's too easy for poor people to kill us. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I hadn't got to that level, but certainly there was some really interesting cultural uh, side effects. But the thing is, um, I just read within the last few days of uh, arrowheads being found in, I think it was Brazil, stone arrowheads uh, from about the 800s current era, 700s, 800s. Now, the introduction of bows into North America was around about the same time. So my guess was that the bow must have spread really fast. Um, it, it wasn't like a like when people moved into the Americas from Asia, they didn't bring bows with them because bows weren't in, used. I mean, they, they were invented. Bows were invented back in, the, uh, you know, 60,000 years ago, but they hadn't travelled when people travelled. So when uh, the Aborigines reached Australia uh, 65 or 70,000 years ago, they brought spear throwers. They didn't bring bows. I mean, the people that moved along after them into, say, New Guinea and that had bows. So it wasn't a big gap, but it seems that the, the more adventurous people got out and started travelling to these far-off places before bows were a large-scale implement for hunting. Uh, the thing is, spear throwers, they're robust. Uh, they're basically one piece things you can carry a, a handful of spears uh which you know i've seen film of aborigine people in australia doing it and when you see um uh, um film of south american uh people they often carry their arrows which are the, almost the size of spears the same way as the aborigines carry their spears so there's a kind i mean it's probably just a practical thing uh but uh you can see how there's not a huge leap from spear throwers and and smaller spears to large arrows and and fairly large bows the bows that i've seen in person have been significantly big um saxton pope refers to one of the bows that that he tested which i think was over six and a half feet long so probably two meters or a little bit more I think he 
you compared it to a Japanese bow, um, and it was, you know, 80 or 90 pounds draw weight. And the, the, the draw wasn't very long. The arrows were really long, but the draw wasn't very long. It, it's it's probably comparable to the draw of New Guinea bows, uh, but, uh, you know, New Guinea bows were drawn very quickly quite far, uh, it, it, you know, like within the range of of a of a uh, an English bow, they wouldn't draw it slowly, like because the the bows would explode. But but that whereas if you look at ancient Egyptians, the the draw lengths shown on the oldest sculptures of archers are only about to here. So um, I mean, they later developed into longer draws, but my guess is that the in South America. Uh, and and this is, it's not a uniform place. They're not all doing the same thing. Um, uh, I met quite a few South American archers. They, uh, there, there were, you know, people um, were encouraging um, native groups to retain their archery. And and uh, when I was uh, able to go to the um, traditional archery, fe archery festival in Korea, world traditional archery festival uh there were quite a few people from south america that were uh brought over to demonstrate their skills and uh it was quite clear that um a lot of technique had been preserved because it's huge south america is huge you you've got big cities and modern infrastructure everywhere but there's still places where people can live fairly traditional lifestyles if they if they so choose uh and uh, brazil i mean it's it's just unbelievably big in terms of, of, of yeah. that kind of thing so i've i've read i've read a lot of uh, things uh before there were ethnographic studies being published that you could get easy access to uh, there are a lot of uh, boys' own adventures, uh, you know, uh, Colonel Fawcett and his trips through the Amazon and all this. Fawcett, not a reliable reporter. Um, Is that and, who was uh, for gold in the city's Z? That's yeah, your... yeah, yeah. Oh, that's yeah, 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 he was. I, I read this when I was a teenager, and <laughs> even then I found it a little bit hard to believe. But um, he... Um, but he was one of many that wrote about this, and there's there's reports of the Kivaru uh, shooting, laying on their back with both feet on the bow and pulling with both hands. Now, people do that in flight archery today. It's not that unusual. But they were accurate doing it, which is very difficult. Um, and uh, there was reports of people, again, shooting monkeys in trees and things like that. Uh, I've seen people shoot, in person, I've seen old equipment that's been collected, you know, from a hundred years ago, and that, and uh, and also there's quite a bit of um, archive film of people in South America shooting. So it's not, you know, it's not um, totally obscure. And I mean, obviously, there's a lot of South American people that are interested in the archery traditions of the area they live in. Even if they're not necessarily related to the people there, uh, it's it's kind of like it's our country, and it should be preserved, which is good. It's good that people want to be interested. In it. And um, I, I I generally found somewhat like uh, uh, um, the um, Anglo Americans. There's a there's a kind of developing spiritual sympathy. For these traditional ways of life, um, uh, even though they, you know, their ancestors might have been shooting one another, uh, there's a, there's a kind of you know developing interest in all these things, which is good. It's good. But getting back to the bows and arrows, say the big differences between say another dense jungle Neolithic cultural area, uh, Papua New Guinea. And and South America in the in the forest there, as opposed to the plains, um, in New Guinea they didn't use any fletching, whereas the South American arrows are often fletched. Now there's two main types of fletching that you hear about. Um, one is called T 
tangential fletching where you take a whole feather, not split or cut or anything, and you get two of them and you just bind it to the shaft and they form a really quite effective um, uh, mechanism for putting drag on the shaft, so getting an accurate flight. And uh, But they also occasionally do what is called radial fletching, which is the same kind of fletching that modern arrows are done with. So they knew several different ways of doing it. It wasn't, they weren't limited to that. And I'll just give you an idea. Here's some, um, I don't know how clear this is. Here's oh, some, uh, yeah. So these these are fletched arrows. Um, the This is from uh, um, the Grayson Collection uh, traditional archery of six continents. Unfortunately, there are only five continents there. <laughs> but, uh, that's the way it goes. Um, yeah, well, it, it says traditional archery from six continents. Where is the six um, continents? Yeah, well, this is it. See, the sixth inhabited continent is Australia, and we didn't have traditional archery in Australia. So um, I, I, I don't know how that uh that's why he says that. Okay, now I understand. Okay, okay, very good, very good. Yeah. Okay. So here's some more arrows. These are these are basically split in half because the arrows are so long they wouldn't fit on the page and you wouldn't be able to see detail. Uh, you can see the fletching is is quite high. Uh, it, it may be um, 10 to 20 centimetres long. Uh, the, the arrows are decorated. I mean, there's a there's a there's a bow grip up in uh, up in the top there, and you can see it's got feathers from parrots and all kinds of things on it. Um, so these weren't, you know, just basically utilitarian. They they put a, a lot of effort into making things attractive. And I mean, uh, these arrows here, if you look at the the wooden heads, they've got designs drawn on them and. I mean, you know, there's a, a high level of artistic um, effort goes into this. Uh, it, just in general, um, some of the things that are noticeable, the arrows have basic V-slot knocks um, generally. Uh, they don't tend to go for the flat strings that you see in New Guinea. Um, and in some parts of Africa, they are the strings are twisted vegetable fibre. They usually make them quite long, and they tie one end and wrap the extra string around the the limb that it's tied to. The other one you can take on the bow easily. So if a string breaks, you've actually got spare string on the bow. Um, this slows the bow down a little, but the arrows are so big and heavy. They get at, at most of the energy out of the bow anyway. Uh, obviously, if you're living in a jungle, you're not shooting long distances usually because the trees get in the way. <laughs> and, so, and you can't see long distances anyway. So uh, a, a lot of uh, – and but the advantage of these really big arrows in dense jungle is if you, if you shoot one, uh, if you don't hit the monkey or the bird you're aiming at and the arrow keeps going, they're a lot easier to find. A normal-sized arrow would just disappear into the undergrowth. And, I mean, there isn't as much undergrowth in the, the big treed areas as there is in the more open forest. Yes. But yes. it's a really practical system. I think on the West Coast where most of the cities were, like the Incas and the Chimu and all these other people, uh, the bows and the arrows were not quite so big. Now, I'm going only on artistic representations that I've seen on fabrics where occasionally they show arches or on carvings on stone and things like that. But the impression I get is they didn't have that kind of super large quality that you see in current tribes in the jungles. And I think the reason is because when you're the 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 um the west coast like in Peru and 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 up into Uruguay and Ecuador and all these places or down into Uruguay, I'm I'm terrible with direction. Um, 
these areas uh, are quite dry. And so you're not mm. worried about losing your arrows or anything. You're, you're worried about shooting as far as you can. Um, the, um, the, there's the, the Andes kind of trap a lot of the, the moist air coming from the Atlantic Ocean. And there's not a lot of moist air coming from the Pacific due to the different um, way the uh, air moves uh, around uh, South America. So you get these very different kind of climates and that. Um, and as I say, further south in Argentina and Chile and, 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 and areas like that, the archery was slightly different again because it was for travelling hunters. There were a lot of wild animals that were suitable for hunting. Uh, many in the in the llama family, llama, um, vicuña, um, all these these uh, technically called camelids because they sh they shared a common ancestor with camels uh, a long way back, and uh, they're um, they produce. I mean, they llamas were domesticated. We call them llamas, uh, depending on what dialect of South American Spanish. The llamas or, or llamas, because um, the double L is pronounced different ways. Um, the um, so they were actual um, domesticated like cattle, so they were raised for wool and meat. Um, the um, but the wild ones, the petunias and 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 that kind of animal were hunted. Um, and uh, I haven't seen a lot of material about how it was done, and certainly how. And and on the plains, they hunted uh, large birds that were like small emus or ostriches called rheas. Uh, uh, and uh, though uh, the the most known method, and you see this being used by gauchos today, is by using a boladores, the the mm -hmm. stones on a rope, and throwing at it to entangle their legs. Um, but almost certainly they were being shot as well because uh, that's just inevitable. As I say, um, the, the the bow progressed from these recent discoveries. It looks like the bow progressed quite quickly into South America after it, it reached North America. So we're assuming the bow came from uh, Siberia across the Bering Strait. It may have come with Inuit people, and then and then move south. Uh, it may have come with another group. I think the the majority of people further south of the Inuit are, are Dene speaking people, uh, and uh, of that family of languages. Sorry, not speaking particularly a a single language, and they may have brought the bow with them. Or, you know, it, it, it might be some other way that it got there. But once it got there, it became rapidly disseminated. I mean, at a level, uh, it's hard to to um, see in other culture, cultures. I'm assuming this is like when horses got loose from Spanish um, farms, rancheros or whatever, and people, the, the native people saw the Spanish riding horses and when they found them, probably they did what people first did when they discovered horses in Eurasia was eat them. But they thought, you know, this riding seems a good idea. And riding rapidly spread. I mean, incredibly rapidly. Like within 100 years in North America, it was all over the place and, and became incredibly common and well-developed. And you look in South America, we, we see more of the kind of, um, European and Indian peoples adopting. I mean, the Europeans bought writing with them, but the 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 writing styles are specific to certain areas of Spain, really, uh, and so are the saddles. and And so there's a lot of cultural import, but the people that were already there could see the usefulness of it. Um, but the archery style, you know, like they didn't change their archery styles that much because they really had efficient archery. They didn't need extra things. So what we saw in those photographs is they had everything from 
wooden points, mm -hmm. sharpened wooden points, bone points, mm -hmm. sharpened bone points, and I'm separating them out because some of them were blunts for uh, killing birds without damaging the feathers um, because the feathers were the valuable part in most cases if you were trading for other things. Uh, and then uh, when metal became available, they quickly adapted metal. But there were an, an enormous number of hardwood arrowheads, and these could be barbed. They could be three part, like there were there were three um, separate heads, sometimes bound together, um, sometimes separate, sometimes with backward for, uh, pointing barbs on the insides where they face each other. These almost certainly are for fishing. Um, and when you consider the the kind of aquatic life in the Amazon and its tributary rivers and, you know, other big rivers, there's a lot of potential um, food there. I mean, some of the fish in the Amazon are monstrously large and, and that's a lot of food. Uh, and, and things like caiman and alligators, uh, you know, we, we look at them as something that's going to try and eat us, but uh, is, people ate them and they made, you know, necklaces out of their teeth. Um, but you have large rodents like capybaras, which are, you know, a lot of meat. And if you've got an, an efficient bow, um, and as I say, this, this, this preponderance of very large arrows meant that if you shot an arrow and you lost it, that would be really unusual because the big arrows are easy to find. Um, if you hit an animal with one of these big arrows, then it's quite difficult for the arrow to run, the, sorry, the animal to run away into the undergrowth because the arrow is, you know, 1.2, 1.5 metres long, and it's not small. It's not going to break when the animal runs, tries to run between the bushes or anything. So it's it's a pretty efficient system for hunting. Um, the the I mean the the other things people use for hunting, as uh, excluding things like snares and traps and stuff like that, because everybody uses those. It's much more efficient of time and it's a lot safer than using a bow and arrow or a spear. But you had spears, you had thrown spears, you had spears thrown with spear throwers at at lateral and and things like that. You had um, boladores, bolas, uh, which were quite efficient. Uh, so you had lots of projectile weapons and arrows and bows had to compete with those. So they had to be efficient. Otherwise you wouldn't use them. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, just uh, some questions to recap regarding the arrowhead. So arrowheads were mostly made of wood, right? Am I correct? Did I understand you correctly? I, I, think, I think the majority of arrowheads were made of wood. Um, I think the second most common material would be bone. Bone, oh, yes. But these arrowheads that have been discovered in Brazil are stone. So maybe they were more common than they, uh, you know, than we understand. I mean, some of the arrows in here in the in this book had stone arrowheads too. So that, but the thing is, if you've got all this abundant hardwood, which you can carve when it you freshly cut the tree down and then let it dry out and it becomes this super hard material then it's it's an obvious choice um but if you live in an area where you've got nice snappable stone um then that's another good choice mostly the arrowheads were attached with tree gums and vegetable fibers um there's very little i've never seen any sinew discussed i would imagine certainly in the jungle areas it would soften from the high humidity and rot from the wonderfully abundant types of fungus that live there um so and there were a lot of good useful vegetable fibers that that could be used 
And back to wooden arrowheads, were they made of one piece together with the shaft, or do we have examples which were separated as well? Uh, they're nearly all separate except for the blunts. Except so um, the um, if you look where the arrowheads join the shaft, you'll see that the shaft is an entirely different material. It's a type of bamboo, basically. Yes. Or, or giant reed. Um, the um, the knocks seem to be carved, if there are knocks. See, sometimes they're just flat. But if there are knocks, and, and some of them have, I, I don't know if you can see this in the, um, these, are the these ones are from Uruguay. And if you look uh, towards the where the fletching of the arrows is, you can see knocks carved into the arrows there. Um, oh, and actually, even better, a detached arrowhead. Um, I, see I see that. So you basically make a tang and fit it into the end of the, the hollow shaft and then bind it so the shaft doesn't split. Um, the actual idea of using four shafts, I mean, most of the, I'm, I'm looking fairly carefully now, and most of these arrows have a four shaft. Even the blunts, if you look at the blunt, um, you can see that the blunt and its four shaft are carved from one piece of wood, but the it's then inserted into an arrow shell. So sophisticated, uh, using the best material for the arrow body and an entirely different material for the arrow head. Um, just, oh, that's interesting. I'm, I'm just trying to find out the five arrows. So according to this, they put a black pitch over the plant fibre bindings that were to stop the shafts from splitting. So the pitch would both act as a glue and a, um, a water-preserving uh, material. Uh, yeah, V-shaped self-knocks. So they actually cut the knock into the reed. Uh Yeah, they, they and they adapted when they got hold of metal. Mm -hmm. uh, they just um, substituted it for the the hardwood or the or the bone shafts. So uh, it it looks like when they used radial fletching, where you split the feather and and glue the end to the the the, the, the rib to the shaft, um, some of these were just two feathers, but they were put on with a slight spiral to increase the spin uh, or increase the drag. But I'm, I'm not 100% sure of this, but it appears to me that below that quiver or little box, it looks like there are three separated arrowheads with either black pitch or something else on them. Um Maybe they carried spare um, arrowheads in a in a container because I mean you can get a, a piece of bamboo and it, it's very easy to make a container out of it. Um, it's not unusual in cultures that use four shafts on arrows to carry spare four shafts because the the, the hard work is carving the the four shaft. Um, Getting a straight piece of reed or or bamboo or whatever, and these these are you've got to remember that the the reeds and that growing in South America are pretty spectacular, um, uh, quite big, strong, um, and the people knew which ones to use. This is always a thing that you see. Um, local people know which materials are the best in anywhere where where you've got to you know rely on, on your local mm -hmm. thing. You're not going to go and pick up the wrong type of reed or anything like that because it's whether you have dinner or not. Yes. Just, okay, just to recap, 
the arrow shaft was made of reed, wood, yeah. and what else? Um, so the 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 basic the, the body of the arrow is a, is a is a large reed, large diameter reed. Um, the knock is carved into the reed. Yes. The feathers are either tied or glued onto the reed. Then the arrow head and its foreshaft, which may be one piece of hardwood, one end carved into an arrow head, the other carved into tapered down to fit inside the, the reed uh, and, 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 and put in with some kind of vegetable glue or pitch and then wrapped with plant fibre. And then sometimes that plant fibre is also covered in pitch to waterproof it and glue the so that it's smooth, like when it goes in, it doesn't um, stop the arrow from penetrating. And also, so you don't, I mean, you, with the style of shooting they use, you're never going to have the arrowhead near your hand. It's always going to be half a metre to a metre in front of your hand, even at full draw. Okay. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's so I, I would see them as basically two-part construction. The front part is the arrowhead, and it's quite large. And the back part is the reed shaft, which mm -hmm. has any feathers glued or tied to it and a knot cut into it. Okay. And yes. the feathers, which type of feathers did they use? They used quite a large variety of feathers. You've got to remember that within the jungle, there are things like eagles and that that would produce feathers that we would traditionally think as good. But there's also very large parrots like macaws and things like that. So if you wanted to have a very attractive feather, and the other thing to think about this is, again, shooting arrows in the jungle, they, they might be big arrows, but if they've got a brightly coloured uh, fletching on them, then um, that's going to make it easier to spot them when you've got to go and collect them. The thing is, all of the um, feathers in this uh, in these photographs, which are good quality coloured photographs, are on arrows that are maybe 50 to 100 years old and the colours have faded. So... Um, Without, you know, I, I'm pretty certain that they, they did some analysis at the museum to to find out which feathers were being used. Plus the fact that they asked people. Um, I, I'm i trying to, uh, I, I think that the South American people I spoke to, are like from indigenous cultures, um, they tended to go for a feather that had the, the size. They liked fairly big feathers. And... Uh, Small decorative coloured feathers were tied on to all kinds of things, but for actual fletching, they like quite large feathers um, and stiff feathers. You've got, you know, birds like condors. That I've seen a condor feather that, was, and then condors feathers are huge, um, uh, and they're perfect for fletching. Unfortunately, there aren't enough Indian condors, so we're, we're going to not use them. But um, yeah, there's quite a variety. I mean, there's just literally a, a, a thousand species of birds. Yeah. And, and a lot of them. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the next question. And the bows are self bows? Yes. Almost entirely, or do they have strengthened bows? No, I've, I've never seen any reference to strengthened bows. They do sometimes have bindings along the, the bow, but okay. they're more decorative than they are um, for strengthening the bow. Okay. Uh, Let me know the poundage, the heaviest bow they used. I, I well, since these were mainly used for hunting, uh, the heaviest bow I've seen referred to is ninety pounds. Um, I think a lot of the hunting bows were in the fifty to eighty pound range, because the arrows are big; they need a lot of push to get them going. Yes. When you're using them for fishing, you're generally shooting down. And you can use the weight of the arrow to help with penetration. So I don't think the fishing bows, um, if they were specifically made for that, were as heavy as the general hunting bows. And okay, very good. And uh, the next question uh, I have, okay, I ask this: Did they also use uh, these bows? Were also used for warfare? Yeah, I, 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 as I said, there was at least one tribe that didn't think you should use bows for warfare, but. Um, uh, certainly quite a lot of other people thought it was quite acceptable and people like the incas and the and and again you know all these the um all these peoples that were living along the the um west coast had large armies they used bows in warfare 
Uh, I mean, we don't hear a lot about that because uh, when the Spanish conquered uh, uh, the Inca Empire, they pretty much suppressed everything that they could because they didn't want the Incas to kick them out. So uh, archery as a as a as a martial art, I think, was suppressed. But people living, you know, uh, in the jungles or on the flat plains, they weren't as mm. interfered with. Um, the spread of cattle ranching on the pampas meant that mm. either the native peoples were absorbed into the gaucho culture, or they were driven off. Um, I I haven't studied South American history well enough to know how good or bad things were. Mm. Um, I certainly met quite a few people that had definite. They were proud of their heritage from native peoples there, so. It, it's they certainly weren't wiped out entirely, but I think there was some pretty serious, um, as the as they call it in Europe, racial cleansing going on at the time. Yes, uh, yes. I, I, I don't know if you've read Voltaire's Candide. There's a section in that about the uh, how the um, Jesuits in South America were trying to stop the government from enslaving all the native population. Uh, yeah. because they wanted yeah. to spend their time converting them to Christianity. And there was this kind yeah. of like, for a while, there was almost a Jesuit republic in, in South America. Um, but, it, it you know, uh, the exploitation of the native peoples was economically important. So it was yes. pursued yeah. with great vigor, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay, another question, or two more questions I have. Yeah, Do sure. we have different types of arrowheads which they used? Oh, yeah, there's quite a large variety that I can see um, from the ones that I actually got to handle in that. Uh, there were narrow-bladed arrow, like long spike arrowheads made out of um, hardwood, which as, I, I would see them having two major purposes. One is uh, maybe to shoot at people, Um they would be quite accurate. And the other is maybe for target archery because they're quite easy to pull out. The next one is hardwood uh, arrowheads that have barbs. Clearly for hunting most of the time because uh, they um, hunting things like monkeys and trees, it's 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 a it's a chancy business. You want to make sure the the arrow is a great impediment to the animal you've shot at getting away because they're so big. So you don't want it to fall yeah. out. Sure. Then there are ones sure. where they have blade blade shapes either carved out of something like bamboo, which you can make razor sharp, or out of bone, which you can make razor sharp. Now, probably they also made similar ones with smaller stone points too, though I haven't seen very many of those surviving. And they were certainly duplicated in metal when they got access to metal. Yes. Okay. And... Uh, um... Metal, you mean like copper, right? Uh, well, certainly the Incas had copper. I've never seen a reference to a copper arrowhead. But once the Spanish arrived, um, the local people rapidly realised that you could turn this this iron that the Spanish had into quite effective arrowheads. Mm -hmm. Now, whether you took an iron pot and broke it up into pieces and, and ground it into arrowheads or whatever, but it didn't take them long to find out this is this is good stuff. And there was a metal culture on, on the on, uh, amongst the Incas and people like that going a long way back. They knew about copper. They did make some kinds of bronze too, I believe. Um, and uh, the, the things I've seen have been things like surgical tools and, and stuff like that. And obviously they knew about gold and silver for, and platinum. What That was one of the rare things. They actually managed to work out a way of uh, using platinum by... Um, making an alloy of platinum and then depleting the surface of silver or gold or whatever else they had until they had a pure platinum surface. So yeah. as metallurgists, they, they didn't use metal on a large scale except in for decorative purposes, but they knew of its potential. And once they were provided with uh, different sources of metal by the Spanish and the Portuguese, uh, they rapidly found ways of using it within their own culture. Yes. 
Okay. And then another question or the last question I have, did they use poisoned arrowhead? Well, uh, that's interesting. I think some of those little arrowheads there, the ones we the detached three arrowheads, may have been poisoned. Um, the bigger arrowheads, they don't need poison. They're just going to hit so hard. It's it's like you know why would a why would a person with an English longbow poison his arrows? They're going to do real damage. But they certainly had a lot of available poisons. The um, poison dart frogs or poison arrow frogs uh, were a source of really toxic poison. Um, they used poisons like curare on their uh, blowgun darts. So it's not outside of the realm of possibility they used them on arrows. But the big heads, I don't think they would have used poison on. Maybe the slender heads with barbs, they could have. The thing is, the arrows were really big, which means that the poison heads were a long way away from the archer. So they were a lot safer to use poison on than you would say... Uh, you know, they talk about those little bronze Scythian arrowheads. Sometimes they have grooves outlining the edges. And, and some um, historians say, oh, that was for poison. And, of course, you have um, uh, the Roman poet talking about them shooting poisoned arrows, but that may have been poetic. Um, Viper's poison, I think he said. But, see, the the there's no actual evidence for that or uh, and certainly little arrows like scythian arrows were much more likely to damage the archer than these giant arrows that were being used in in south america so if they did use poison uh i think the archers were a lot safer it's possible that those little arrowheads were kept separate in a container and then put on when you actually went out to go hunting uh, that's certainly similar to what was done by the sand bushmen in, in South Africa. Uh, so uh, there's places where the bows were quite powerful and they still use poison. Um, and there's parts of Africa where that was so. And there are other places where the bows were powerful and they didn't use poison. And that's a lot in places where you draw the arrowhead right back to your hand as opposed to having part of the arrow sticking out in front of the bow. Um, I mean, I can understand in Africa, if you're hunting something the size of an elephant, then maybe you want all the help you can get. <laughs> and there's certainly in China, there's references to poisoned arrows. Uh, and, and because in, in Southeast Asia, uh, crossbows were made to shoot poisoned arrows because, again, thick jungle, but fairly lightweight projectiles, you wanted something that would eventually kill the animal. And they were brought into warfare in China. so. Um, in the, uh, I think in the Song and Ming dynasties, it, it's not uncommon to see pictures of crossbowmen with little gourds yes. to contain the poison. So, and there's a famous uh, account in the Romance of the Three Kingdoms about Guan Yu uh, being shot in the arm and having a surgical procedure done while he was playing chess because they didn't have anaesthetics. So he concentrated on his chess game to uh, protect him. So, I look. I'll, I'll do some more research. I'll, I'll, when I dig out my book uh, for our second thing on Brazilian Indian archery, I'll see what it says because that was a fairly thoroughgoing investigation with Brazilian anthropologists providing some of the information. It was written by two people, one of them a, a famous English archer, um, Edward Heath. Uh, but uh, I, I, off the top of my head, uh, I can't remember for sure. I can't see any reason they wouldn't have if they wanted to. Yes, perfect. But I don't think those big arrowheads were used for poison because if anything got hit by one of those, it would be killed by the arrowhead. Okay, me. Thank you very much. Uh, at the end of our discussion, so we are going to have a follow up. We go to Brazil yeah. and there. So for the, this is the first part of South American archery, and then we will continue with uh, with then the next one, which is we go into detail in Brazil and the, that area. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Pete, and I wish you a nice day. Thank you. Thank you very much. You too.